it's I don't want to say I'm excited about it because it's kind of heavy, but I felt like like I had to do it. I got, I got to get it out. It's in my brain and I ha- in, in my heart, and I have to have to put it out there. So. Good morning. Hey y'all, how the heck are you? Hope you're having a great day so far. Let's, um, if you're new here, well, welcome to you. Um, I'm Amanda, my name, my name is Amanda Kuliba and I like to sit down usually on Thursdays and talk about art and you know, how you might use art in your classroom and get ready. So if you're an art lover or you're an educator and this is your jam, I suggest you subscribe and like and comment so we can engage and be friends. Now, today's topic is a heavy one. I have, I'm, I'm, I, so I'm on Pinterest. You go, you can go follow me on Pinterest. I'll drop, there's, I think there's a link. There'll be a link in the description. But I actually like wiki art for categorizing and saving art. So it, you can, make folders on there, not boards. It's not interactive like Pinterest. You don't follow people and whatever, but you can make, but it makes me think of Pinterest because you can, so you can take what you like and you can put it in categories or folders. So I use WikiArt a lot and I love to show it to teachers and tell teachers, you get on there and you just, if you love art and you like are looking for things for your students, you can kind of get, in, I mean, it's a really helpful tool being able to categorize and save things. I, this morning I got up and I was looking at it because I'm getting ready to teach some lessons um, after the holidays and I needed to find some artworks to go with them. So I got on there and I was looking through my folders and I found a folder that I had made a while ago called No Words. And I was like, hmm, I, I don't remember what I, what's in that. So I opened it and it, it was, it, there were six artworks in there that I just, you know, you could say you have no words, but I do have words because I'm about to talk about them. But it, I guess by no words, I meant it like gives you pause and you have to sit with it and it hurts. You got to like, just let it hurt, hurt. Um, so I thought I really should share these. These artworks have some really, there's great opportunities with these artworks to evoke empathy in your students. Um, thinking about these works can just enrich your own life. It make it make you a better person. Thinking about them, it's a good way to teach some social and political and um, cultural issues. I think issues is a good word. So you're gonna be exposed to some images that are triggering here. Um, they, And I'm not trying to trigger anybody. I don't want you to be triggered. If you're gonna be upset by any violent images or images of slavery and um, people who are not alive, don't stop the video. I don't want you to be triggered. I don't want you to be upset. Stop the video or just know that it's coming. These are hard topics. These are hard images to look at and, but they're important, they matter and it's worth talking about. So I wanted to do this because these images are very powerful and reflecting on these images in the context in which they were created can make us better people. And I think that's important, but we can also use it with our students, depending on their age and readiness level and what you're trying to teach because we can evoke empathy with them. We can teach them about things that have happened in society in our culture and with human beings throughout history. So here we go, let's get started. I'm only gonna show you five of the six that I had in my folder. I don't even know why I told you I had six in there, but I'm only gonna show you five because two of them are by the same artist. So I'm gonna stick to the, the I'm gonna stick to five of them. It's just nice. Five is a good chunk of a, you know, that's just a nice number. So five, we're doing five, not six. I don't even know why I said that. Stop talking about it, Amanda, it's irrelevant. And I'm going to go in order of the earliest one to the latest one. And there's there's one that I've, that doesn't give us a date, but based on the birth and death of the artist, 
I can put it in order. So I'm only, I'm not going to go into depth. Like a lot of times I go really, really deep into one artwork when I'm doing these get ready with me's. And I'm not going to do that here because there's five of them. I'm going to take the painting, the work of art, and I'm going to talk about four or five things. I'm going to try to give you a little bit of context. And maybe, you know, if you guys want me to, I could break it down and do like one video on each one. But so we're doing that sort of an introduction here, and I hope that this will spark some interest and you can go look up these things. So the first one I want to talk about is Pieta by Michelangelo. It was created, or the date we have for its creation is 1499, and they kept pretty good records um, during the Renaissance, like the Vatican, because it's, it's a sculpture. It's made out of marble. It was created in Florence, Italy, but it is at the Vatican in St. Peter's Basilica. They kept, they, they, the Catholic Church keeps pretty good records. So we, the date we have is 1499. Y'all, that was a long time ago. Can you believe that? How long ago that was? Sometimes I can't. Can you believe how long ago that was? I mean, look at, look at this work of art and think about the fact that this was created in 1499. I have never seen this in real life, but I want to so bad. I have to get my act together and get around and go. And I should. I've had many opportunities to go see these works and I've not taken them. And then, and then the pandemic hit and I was like, oh, what if I never get to travel again in my lifetime? Anyway, that's a side note. So the, what I want to tell you about this work is it, it depicts Mary holding Christ after he has died on the cross. You don't have to be religious to relate. You don't have to be a Christian or to be religious to relate to this work. Just, because it, it's a mother holding her child. And it is so realistic. Jesus's body is so thin. You can see his ribs. And so what, there's a reason why this work is so, is what it is. It, it's the mother for me. Um, it could be the Christ for other people is the reason why they are so drawn to it. But for me, it's the mother. Um, and even before I had children and when I didn't have children, even back when I didn't think I wanted to have children, I could still relate to this because this woman is, he's not even a, a baby. She's holding him. Like you might hold a baby, like you might hold your sleeping child. I have a seven year old who still crawls up in my lap and lets me rock her like that. And here's this mother holding her grown son that way who's just been persecuted and killed, murdered, received the death penalty, and she watched it, you know. The other, and so in her face, her face is not, she doesn't, her face is sorrowful and pitiful. She's solemn. You, there's pain in her face, but she's not, she has a, resi, a look of resignation which makes me sad, almost like she accepts, you know, and that's sad. If you, if you take away the divine from this and you look at that mother holding her child and she's just accepted it, resigned to it, that's so sad. But the, the main thing about Mary in this, in this work is her body to me. The folds of her body just, just, ooze motherhood to me. Her body just oozes womanhood. It's round and full and it's, her body is spread really wide. You can look at her legs. It's almost not, I, I, I think bottom, I think that Michelangelo, Michelangelo exaggerated the bottom half of her body um, to make it, it's almost a triangular shape and it's really wide at the bottom. I mean, the whole sculpture is almost a triangle or a pyramid shape and but the bottom is much wider than the, the top and her but her shoulders are broad her bosom is there she's she's not like she's shaped like a woman and that body it's a strong body but it almost looks like this body is about to absorb that child of hers back into the womb she's just about to come over and just take that child back it's it's remarkable so i really love this one it brings it like brings me joy because it makes i mean i love how he has depicted mary as a mother 
and not just a religious figure. This is mother at the funeral of her child. And this is also, you know, it's related to the last one. It's kind of next on the timeline, the best I can tell. This is the one that I don't know. There's no date on it. But we do have the artist, like, birth date and death date. So I'm putting this one next because it's in the public domain already. That's the information I have from WikiArt is that it's in the public domain. And in the United States, images have to be like the artist has to die and then 70 years or something like that. So I, this was probably painted early in his career. So I think this comes next on the timeline. You know, it's a mother dealing with the death of her child, which is sad. And this is why I gave the trigger warning. There's nobody, there's really not, there may be some people in the background here, but for this to be called mother at the funeral of her child, it's, there's not very many people there. And I don't know where the people are. Like, she's so lonely to her. She is so lonely. It's stark. And her child is not there. In Pieta, Mary's, the mother still has her child in her arms. Here, the child is gone. And we know since it's a funeral, the child has probably been buried or um, however they take care of their loved ones who have passed in this scene. She's lonely. There's... The lighting in this painting strikes me quite a bit because she's on the, if you're looking at the painting on the left-hand side, it's very bright. There's a lot of light there. That's the light source. Then on the right-hand side, if you're looking at it, it's dark and it's like there's um, almost, she does not look to me to be in an actual building. That looks almost like a cave or like um, an outdoor kitchen. There are buildings. So we know this is not like, ancient times this is there are buildings there one of the buildings in the background even has like a steeple kind of at the top a dome but she's so she's not like a cave dwelling she, this is not a cave dwelling society but she's um that's why i kind of like you can kind of see bricks in the background i just wonder if it's some kind of outdoor kitchen um but i i so it's this where the mother is gets really dark like she's turning away from the light here she's turned her body away from the light source and she almost a, it looks like she's about to move into the dark which i get and that's what i can imagine she might be feeling so i would say for this one what is it's it's powerful the image itself is just really powerful and what's that light, the lighting is super significant because of where, of the composition, like where the mother is, what she's doing with her body, that body language. And that's why I think this one, that's why this one belongs in this video and why I put it in that folder. That breaks me. And her face, she is broken. She is, she's sad and she's grieving, but she looks mad as heck and she looks like she's done she's not gonna try anymore she's done maybe something happened i mean i am totally making this part up but you almost wonder like what happened to her child did someone harm her child is she about to get revenge and she's turning toward the dark so there's a lot of things to wonder about this one but the lighting is super significant and the placement of the mother a little to the left if you're looking at it because it, it's off centered there's a lot of light going on like there's so much more of the painting that shows light than doesn't but it, i think it's because everybody you know maybe everybody else is going on with their business and has moved on and you know that's why the the majority of people have already moved on about their business after the death of her child and she hasn't. So it's just a very lonely, lonely painting. Okay. The next one that I want to share from this folder from uh, that, you know, ran across this morning. The next one I want to share is 
It's the immigrant family in the baggage room of Ellis Island, and it's a photograph. And this style is called social realism, capturing the real. And the reason this, this, I don't have a lot of context about this. I'm, I'm going to speak to you just from looking at the image and trying to figure out what I'm trying to say what I can figure out to know about it just from looking at the image. They're at Ellis Island. The photo is dated 1905. So this would have been a period of American history where we were bringing in a lot of people here. We were trying to grow our population. We needed people to work. Let me, let me just say, the rich people needed people to come here and work. I just, anyway, anyway, social realism. So wait, I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't have a whole lot of context. I don't have all the context on this. I am just going by the image and what the title tells me. So I don't know where, the, if there's any other family, I don't. I just don't know anything. I don't know if she's, if there's like a dad or if she, if, there, if she has like parents, I just don't know. Um, which, which, again, I don't have to know to be able to identify with this. I don't have to have all that info. So she, the mother, or the older woman, the adult in the image, she looks super worn out. She is she looks old. Her skin is leathery and the wrinkles on her forehead, like there is such a contrast that value, the value in this one between the light and the dark on her forehead. I mean, and, and just the sun and dark across her nose. And at the top, we, she looks like she has been working hard her entire life to me. And knowing that there are immigrants coming on Ellis Island, that's probably, probably, Probably the truth, right? And they look like they just don't have a lot of money. Um, because, I, you know, I think that little girls, I feel like they might have on nice, their nicer clothes, but that little um, boy's clothes look kind of dirty in some places. So they've been traveling, of course, but they don't have much stuff and they don't have nice luggage. I don't know what nice luggage looked like back then, but I feel like that was not it. He has, looks like he has a pillowcase or just a sack on his back. So let's talk about just, let's just look at their expressions. The mom, she almost, she has like a very concerned look. She almost to me feels like mm, she knows she's got a lot to like try to keep up with right now. There's a lot going on and she's got to try to keep up with everything. She's got to make sure she doesn't lose any of her children, that they get where they're supposed to go. You know, she looks like, I mean, she's weary. She's tired looking. She, but she also has some smile lines, you know. So maybe this woman was, was a joyful woman. Dealt up, you know, a difficult hand. She also, um, she, she's holding the little one and that little one, if you look real close, there's sh it's shiny right here on her face. And I think she looks like she's been crying and it's so pitiful. That little girl's fat. I mean, she just looks like she's been crying. So the look on the mother's face, like if her children are upset and stressed out and whatever, and she's trying to get, you know, they are at Ellis Island. This is not like a place where you can just have a throw down in the middle of the floor, kids, you know, just, just what a stressful situation. And the little one's crying, but look at her sweet little feet and those sweet little hands and cheeks and eyes, just so sweet. And then the, the middle child is, also looks like they might have been crying. But she's holding on to the boy's hand, and I think that's so sweet, too. I just, when I look at this, I don't have to have a whole lot of information. My husband immigrated to the United States. Um, he did not go through Ellis Island, obviously, came through Los Angeles. Like, it's a whole, immigrating to the United States now is a whole different thing than it was back then. But I have, like, a real soft place for anything that's related to immigration in history or current. And 
immigrants. I just have a very, very soft place for that. And I can't imagine what it must have been like to put everything you own in a pillowcase, get on a boat and go to a new country where you don't even know if you're going to have a job. You barely know, like, do you know where you're going to sleep? And then to be bringing your three kids with you, I just cannot imagine that. My heart just does something when I think about that. So the next one that I want to show you is from 1945. And this one is going to, this, of all of the, I don't know, they all, they all maybe, they all break me, but this one is very hard to look at. It's by William H. H. Johnston, Johnson, who is a pretty well-known artist. This is called Nat Turner, and I'm going to take just a second and probably spend a little bit more time. But I wish I, I, that somebody like Bailey Sarian or who are the, the Mile High Media people, I wish that somebody like that would take on Nat Turner's story and sh do some research, more research and just tell us about it. Nat Turner was an enslaved preacher who led a revolt of enslaved people. And it, it resulted, this, this, he led a rebellion. And the rebellion, it was in Virginia in, in 1831, and it resulted in the deaths of between 55 and 65 people. 51 of those people were, at least 51 of the people were white. So. We already know this is going to be a really no good, no good story. A slave person led a rebellion and 51 white people died in, what was it, 1831. It's no good. We just already know, no good. Nat Turner survived the rebellion. They didn't, uh, they didn't quite, they did not get what they wanted out of this rebellion. It, it, it resulted in just a mass murder afterwards. Uh, the militias that, that, of people who were not slaves, the white people, formed militias, got organized, and they retaliated. They formed militias, and it was mass murder. They hunted these rebels down like animals. Um, Turner was educated. Nat Turner was educated, and he could read, and he could write. And this is what made him a leader. What made him a, a leader? This is what made him a leader made him question and there's a lot to the story like I said I wish somebody would take it on like Bailey Sarian or in, in her dark history podcast this is I can't get into all this but we're, we're talking about this artwork I'm trying to also give you enough context to know why this is terrible why it's so hard to look at this after the rebellion oh Nat Turner so he managed to hide for like six weeks or something a period of time he was able to hide when they found him though they hung him and that is terrible enough. Like that is just, it's so hard. To, it's so hard to talk about this. They hung him and then they took his body and they dismembered it, flayed his flesh and made purses and things out of his skin that they sold as souvenirs. I mean, white people, come on. What the cuss word? Like, good Lord. I just have mercy. I just don't. To, so to me, thinking about this, this is what these people were doing back then, to slaves, who had the audacity to like want something better for their human existence on this planet, and we just could not give it to them. Oh, God. And you may say, oh, that was terrible. And that was a long time ago. Well, I know but there are people who still think like this. And it, that is disgusting to think like this. Now, um, I'm going to move off from the darkness of that. But what is significant about this painting for me is William H. Johnson, who is, like I said, very popular, very well-known artist, depicted this. And if he had not, I don't know that I would know who Nat Turner was. Because ask me if I ever studied and learned about Nat Turner in school. Did you? Did you know who Nat Turner was? Did you know that a few years ago, not that many years ago, someone get, someone donated a skull 
to a collector who was going to start a museum and that it was supposed to be Nat Turner's skull. See? Yeah, we're talking about a human being. This is somebody's child. This is somebody's friend. That's somebody's brother. It's a human being. And I'm sorry, I don't care if you're, if you're doing a civil rights museum or not. I'm not going to name these people. You can go read about this. But you don't display a skull, someone's skull, as an artifact who was murdered. Oh, and that this is a topic for another day, but that gets that makes me think about all these like Egyptian mummies and things that we've dug up and we gotta look at. I can't it's, we're talking about people, y'all. So I have like let me any thoughts about that, but I don't think so. Somebody gave a skull to a collector who was gonna open a civil rights museum and they said it was Nat Turner's skull. I'm sorry. Look, I, I will say that I believe the right thing maybe was done here because they gave his they gave that part of his body back to his descendants so that they could bury it and the rest of his body had apparently been put in an unmarked grave. But I mean, just, okay, just, if your head's not exploding right now, I don't know. It's so, it's so much. I can't, again, this is not a dark history kind of show. So I can't, I just, I'm not going, oh my gosh. Okay, so the reason this is important artwork is because if William H. Johnson, who I already knew about, I, I know William H. Johnson's work. I, I really respect him as an artist. He's well known. If he had not painted this, we would not probably know who Nat Turner was and we would not be talking about him. So educate yourself and thank goodness for William H. Johnson for taking on this, this subject matter that's very hard. And you teach your students about who Nat Turner was. Okay, I, I have to go on to the next one. The last one and it's from 1948. So not, not long after Nat Turner. This is George Pemba, and this is called No Work. I think, I, I think when I when I put this artwork in this folder, and I was feeling really moved by it, I was thinking, you know, that moved me. I was thinking about the Great Depression, but now I have COVID as a reference for this, and I think about No Work and. Yeah, y'all, I don't want to get into it about, because some people think there's plenty of jobs and lazy, and people are lazy and living off the government and just don't want to work. I know people think that. I hear it. I live in the South. Believe me, I know that that's what people think. I don't agree with that. I'm telling you that's what other people, I know that's what other people think. I'm telling you right now during COVID when every, so my frame of reference for this is not the current situation, and I'm not trying to bring up the current situation where there's a lot of jobs being posted everywhere. I'm thinking about when there were shutdowns and people weren't able to go to work and people who had for generations never had to accept any government assistance suddenly had to get unemployment. Y'all, that was hard on people. I didn't have, I mean, that was hard on people. Um, and so anyway, so now I kind of have like that as a frame of reference for looking at this, but he's, you know, what's going on here? Let's look at the light again. Lighting has been very powerful in these works that we've seen today. The title is No Work. There is a, this is a brown person, a brown male, an African-American male, a black male. There is a white woman in the background dressed up in her Sunday best. I don't know if this woman, I don't know if there's supposed to be like a contrast there of, there's there, there's actually more than one white person with their purse and they, they like they're living it up back there. I don't know if that is what those women are doing or if these are like ladies who are, are working. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. But I also see like there are other people. There are people in the background. It looks like they're shopping. There's hustle and bustle. Somebody's got a nice blue car back there. They look, these people look fancy. And then there is this black, very young guy that doesn't have work. And if he doesn't have work, he doesn't have much, does he? He's not a part of whatever's going on in that background. And he still, and he also can't get a job in any of those places, probably, in 1948. It's just, it's sad, but the, the light source 
his face, he is looking up and at the light, almost like he has hope. He's still young enough. He's not been broken. He's, he has hope. These were five artworks that just kind of broke me this morning when I found them. And I wanted to share them with you. I want to hear what your thoughts are. I mentioned, you know, that I like, this is about school. Like this is about education and using art to educate. Then, and I mentioned that all of this could be, all of these works have historical reference historical, cultural, and social context. So you can use them in classrooms. Of course, again, and I say this, every time I bring up something controversial, you know your students and you know your context where you teach, you know which artworks can be shown to your specific students. You know what's age appropriate, developmentally appropriate, and you know, curricularly, is that a word? You know what's appropriate to the curriculum. So use your judgment. But also, like, become a better person because you're thinking about these things and looking at these works. But be a better adult. Be a better human. I just wanted to share. This is art that makes you smarter. I am not finished with my makeup. A big shock. I can't ever get finished with my makeup when I'm talking about the artwork because I get so just distracted. I'm going to finish my makeup real quick and then we'll wrap this up. Okay, guys, that was Art That Makes You Smarter. You know, I said this was a bonus, Art That Makes You Smarter. These are were works that just break me. These are not the only works that break me. Like, I'm an art, I am an art lover. It's in my DNA. Like, it is in my bone marrow. It, it, it's in every cell of my body. But I, so these are not the only works that break me. These are the five works I chose to show you today. I'm going to, you know, I think I'll do some like these works bring me a lot of joy or these works make me feel anxious kinds of videos too for art that makes you smarter because we are going to become smarter and we're going to become better humans because we're going to talk about art. That's what we're going to do on this channel. So again, I'm Amanda Kulaba and I hope you have a wonderful day. I will see you guys later. Let me know if you need anything and don't forget to subscribe. Bye guys.